Life is fragile. It's a fact we're learning in real time, every day. What we once called normal has seemingly disappeared. There's uncertainty in the air, restlessness in our hearts. Things we once took for granted are becoming difficult to find. Our usual day-to-day -day has evolved into this odd chaos. Peace is becoming obsolete. Many have lost jobs, security, and those they love. The pain is undeniable. But what if our fragility caused us to lean harder into God? What if, in our weakness, we chose to rely more on His strength? Would our outlook change? Would the peace that passes understanding begin to drown out the noise of this moment? Would we walk in a quiet confidence, knowing our God is mighty to save? We're not promised tomorrow, but we are given a simple truth to stand on. Our God goes before us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Yes, life is fragile. But in our weakness, He is strong. Welcome to church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sunday, church. Good morning. Good morning, church. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. And it's time to worship. Good morning and welcome to worship. Welcome to worship. Good morning and welcome to worship. And welcome to worship. Good morning and welcome to worship. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Welcome to worship. Good morning. Welcome to church. Welcome to worship. And welcome to worship. Good morning and welcome to church. Welcome to church. Welcome to worship. Welcome. Good morning and welcome to church. We love you all so much. Yeet. Yeet. Hey friends, glad you're here this morning. And today we have a wonderful time of worship as we gather at our homes today and praise God together. I wanna invite you to go to your refrigerator, grab whatever juice you have and whatever bread you have and to celebrate communion with us today. And I want you to prepare your hearts as much as you can to worship God 
as we gather as a community of faith. We're glad you're here. So happy that you're here to worship with us this day at Oceanside First Presbyterian Church. We're glad you've come and joined our online community. And we want to know that we are a community that is seeking to reach, teach, and serve our community in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Liz. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm grateful that you've joined us here. If you could make sure to let your presence be known by going to the comment window and pressing that check in button, you can check in there as well as put any prayer requests because we would love to pray for you. Well, it's the middle of summer now and we are getting ready for the fall and all of the exciting things that are going to happen in the fall. We also want to let you know that there's lots of Bible studies and discipleship opportunities that are meeting right now. So take a look at our website, OceansidePress.org, and you can find all of those opportunities there. We're here to worship our God this morning. So let's get ready and praise the Lord loudly. Let's go. About 244 years ago, a group of brave men added their name to a document that marked the birth of this incredible place we call America, our home. It's a nation of independence and of freedom. It began with, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights of life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now it's taking quite a bit of time for that all men to really become all people, but we're seeing it happen. One of our founding fathers, John Adams, was right when he wrote about this day, this Independence Day weekend, that it ought to be commemorated as a day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. You see, it took amazing acts of faith for these men to, to, to add their names to a document that literally signed their own death warrant. And it's in light of that kind of faith, it's in light of that kind of drive, it's in light of that kind of hope that I want to invite you to pray with me now, a prayer not only for our community, but for our nation and for this world. Would you please pray with me? Mighty God of the ages, today we give thanks for true freedom. We know that true freedom only comes from you and through you. Lord, let us be forever watchful of our hearts that we might not ever again fall blindly into the traps of sin and self-seeking pride. Instead, Lord, let us learn how to lift one another up. Let us look to your skies above our heads and let us look to those beautiful lands that you have created and let them all be a consistent reminder of your hand at work within your people and in this land as we trust in the independence and freedom you've given us. Let the grace of your son and the wisdom of your word direct us, lead us, protect us, and guide us. <clears throat> Let us embrace the words spoken by Samuel Adams as the Declaration of Independence was being signed. He said this, 
We have this day restored the sovereign to whom all men ought to be obedient. He reigns in heaven, and from the rising to the setting sun, let his kingdom come. On this Independence Day weekend, Father, we do not celebrate our own accomplishments. No, we celebrate yours, Lord, your accomplishments in us and through us. May you receive the glory. May you receive the laud. May you receive the honor. And may we learn how to be even better stewards today of the freedom that you've given us and the forgiveness that you provide us. We pray all this in your son's holy name. Amen and amen. Good morning, church. Let's sing. Who am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call? Is it true that you are thinking of me, how you love me? It's amazing, I'm a friend of God. I am a friend of God. about resurrection, talking about new life, a new life coming about us through Jesus Christ. And I know that all of us 
have days when we think, I don't know how new life is ever going to come from anything. God has a history of making the dead alive, bringing new life to all of our lives. So as we come to God in prayer this morning, let us give those places where we are feeling without hope and without life. Let us give those places to God today. Let's pray together. Out of the depths, we cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our voice and be attentive to our prayers. We pray for those who hope is lost, feel dried up and cut off from you. By your grace, open their grave. Bring them back to the land of the living. We pray for those who are oppressed, held captive by the power of death. Release them from their chains, unbind them, and let them go. We pray for those who weep, loss and lifeless in fear and regret. Grant them the peace of your presence. Show them what your love can do. And we pray for those who are dying, the light of life fading from their eyes. Help them to believe in you so that they may live and never die. We thank you, O oh Lord, for having heard our prayers. Enable us to trust in you and thus to see your glory through Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Oceanside First Presbyterian Church. I am excited that you're with us this morning as today we're continuing on in our series of the I am statements that Jesus made. We've been, we've been digging in for the past five weeks trying to figure out the, the depth and the significance when Jesus says that phrase, ego ami, I am. And today we're looking at one of the big ones when he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, if today's your first Sunday with us or it's your first time watching us online, I want to say welcome. I'm glad you're here with us. Thank you for joining us. You're going to find that our church, this community, is an amazing, wonderful, friendly, kind group of people that aren't perfect, not even close. We got flaws and we're still figuring it out. A friend of mine likes to say that we're just all stumbling toward Jesus together. And as a church family, as a community, we're committed to reaching teaching, and serving our community with the grace, truth, and love of our Savior. So this morning, as we dig in, we're, we're talking about those, those I am statements. And I just told you we're talking about I am the resurrection and the life. But Jesus made six other statements. Here they are. He says, I am the bread of life. He says, I am the light of the world. He says, I am the sheep gate. He says, I am the good shepherd. Today, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And lastly, he says, I am the true vine. Now, John, again, was intent on making sure that his listeners and his readers could not miss the fact that he was pointing Jesus out to be God. Not something close to God, not an ambassador of God, not a messenger of God, not part of God, but God. He wants to make it clear that Jesus is saying, I am God. Now, as, as we dig in today, you, you know me, I, I like to preach one idea and one idea only. And today's idea is an idea that's been rolling around in my head for about the last four weeks. You may have heard me even mumble this a few times on our morning show, Let's Go, which I, I talk to everybody on Facebook at 8 o'clock from 8 to 8.15 and here's, here's what I said, and it's just been stuck in my head and my heart until we reach today, and now I know why it's been there. It's God's delay is not God's denial. Let me say that again. God's delay 
is not God's denial. So would you pray with me as we begin and we dig into this text? Father, we ask right now that our hearts would be open to your word, that that, that our lives would be ready to be shaped and molded by you, and that we might have ears to hear and follow you with our whole heart and our whole life. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. Amen. Now, I know that every one of us has an issue when it comes to waiting. Nobody likes waiting. Um, Sometimes when we wait too long, we tend to lose hope. Have you ordered something in the mail and then forgotten that you've ordered it and then it's, it, and you just gave up and it's just not going to show up and then six weeks later, it shows up? It, some, that's waiting and that's what it's like to give up when you're surprised by something coming through that you didn't anticipate coming through. Does anybody ever get kind of, well, ticked off or upset that God's timing is not your timing? That sometimes God might be asking you to wait as opposed to, I want it now. I want an Oompa Loompa now, Daddy. (laughs) I I think about it this way. Sometimes we're the one sitting at the stoplight and the person in front of us, the light turns green and they don't go. And within two seconds, our hands instantly hovering over that honk. Or we're on the other side of it. We're the person in front. The lights turn green and we didn't even notice. And the next thing we know, there's someone honking right behind us. People, we're not good. We're not good at waiting. How about when you go to a restaurant? Do you remember going to restaurants? (laughs) That seems like ages ago. But think back with me. Go back with me all three months ago when you'd go to a restaurant with friends, with family, and you'd order something and everybody else's food would come out, but your food didn't and you had to wait. I I remember my heart would be going, okay, for every minute, there's a percentage of that tips going away because I'm not good at waiting. Or how about this? You're you're going to the bank, you're gonna go use the ATM, but there's one person in front of you. There's one person in front of you, but they've got a stack of paper this big and they're basically trying to do a hostile takeover of their bank at the ATM, yet they really don't even know how to use the ATM buttons. That's just infuriating and make you go crazy. And the last one for me is waiting is when I'm called to go to the doctor. And so when I go to the doctor and I make my appointment and I sign in and they take my little peely sticker and they stick it on the appointment chart and I'm like, great, we're good to go. And they say, the doctor will be with you and you sit in the waiting room and then you sit for 55 minutes. In my heart, I'm going, 55 minutes? I I don't wanna be here at all. Uh, And my blood pressure is going up or going down, depending on how nervous I am. And and I'm afraid I'm going to pass out right there in the lobby of the the doctor's office. I'm not good at waiting. And I imagine you're not good at waiting either. That we feel within our own understanding of time and timing and everything else that we have waited long enough. It's our time right now. But what if, what if the waiting that we're going through? What if this pause that we're in, what if this moment that that our whole world is in, this, this, this wait, this yellow light, what if this yellow light is all to bring something much, much bigger, something much, much better? What if this waiting moment was to glorify God? What if God is working on something so much bigger we can't even begin to imagine it? That's what happens in our verse today as we look at John chapter 11. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Nine to nine, 
never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You are So if you have your Bible with, with you, I want you to open it up to John chapter 11 so you can always read along and check that I'm not cheating. Um, and I also know that you're gonna find things that God is gonna draw your attention to anyway. And I want you to, to figure out those things and work on those things while you're reading along. If you're, if you're um, online with me right now in the comments, you can add anything that you, pop, that you think pops out that, that, that's speaking to you right now. Uh, you might find that someone else has that same thing that's jumping out to them. And so today we're gonna jump into John chapter 11. I hope you're there with me. John chapter 11 is what I call a hinge point in John's gospel. Up till now, Jesus has been doing ministry and everything leads up to this last week of his life. The last 10 chapters of John are all about the last week of Jesus's life. And so here we are when Jesus is going to make this bold claim in the 11th chapter as he's beginning to turn his face toward Jerusalem. Read along, it'll be on screen. Now Jesus is just heard the news that his good friend, uh, the brother of Mary and Martha, his good friend Lazarus is deathly ill. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. Church, that means that Jesus delayed his arrival to Bethany only about two and a half, three miles away by four days. In the day that he received the information, he took two days of pausing. And then on the fourth day, he traveled over to Bethany. The story continues at verse eight. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you and yet you were going back? Now, we remember that almost in every encounter that Jesus has had so far at the temple, according to John, has ended with people close to stoning him or picking up stones and getting ready to stone him. The disciples have been outside of that environment for a little while, and they're kind of liking not having that pressure on them. And now Jesus is saying, we're going to go back, back to where they're trying to kill us. They thought that Lazarus had just fallen asleep because he says that later in the passage, but he, con he, he confirms that, no, no, Lazarus is actually dead. And then they respond, but Thomas says, well, let's go, to, let's, let's go that we might all die together. The key part of this first scene that we have with Jesus as he's preparing to go, as he's preparing to go to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus is that he says, this is all going to happen for God's glory. This is another one of those events. This is a, one of those moments where God has already known this was going to happen and, and it was all designed so that God might be glorified through this. Literally, so that God's son may be glorified through this. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Mary is at home because she's weeping. She's mourning. It's been four days since her brother died. She is in the depths of grief. She, she is hurting with that pain that feels to be unconsolable. 
She's waiting for that pain to end. And, and she was waiting for Jesus to come as Martha was waiting for Jesus to come, as we're going to hear. Martha says this, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Martha what she says right there is such a powerful truth. The, anytime there's a but in scripture, you have to pay attention to it because it changes everything. L literally, Martha says, um, I, I recognize that my brother's gone, but I believe that God's gonna do anything you ask. It's, she's not fully limited, but she does recognize that a lot of time has gone by and she's waited and waited and waited. It was as if she was saying, Jesus, I know that you could have prevented this, that you could have healed, you could have healed them, that you, if you would have been here on time, you would have brought him right back. But right now, he's in the cave. The stone is rolled. Rigor mortis has set in. He's begun that process of decaying. He is beyond even your reach, Jesus. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha replied, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. You see, Martha has come to the uh, understanding that she's going to have to wait even longer for this moment, this resurrection at the last day. She says, I know that he's going to be resurrected at the last day. That shows me that she, she already believes in a life after this life. She believes um, th that there is, there's something waiting for her, for her sister, for her family, for her brother. But Jesus interrupts her when, when she says, I know he will rise again at the resurrection at the last day. It's as if Jesus, the moment she says the resurrection, Jesus steps in and says, I am the resurrection and the life. She's talking about a far off future event and Jesus is saying, no, it's not a far off future event. You're looking at the embodiment of the resurrection. Uh, uh, he, he, he's claiming the things that we've already seen him claim in the stories of John, that he is the creator, that he is the one that literally has breathed life into all creation. And now he is going to once again breathe life into Lazarus. He is the one that called creation into being with simple words. And in just a second, he's going to call Lazarus from the grave, the impossible possible feat, just by saying, Lazarus, come out. Jesus says this to her. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the son of God, the Messiah who has come into the world. Is there a clearer statement of Jesus's divinity than Martha's claim right there? I kind of think that Martha in her waiting was a little bit upset that when she encountered Jesus on the road, she knew that it didn't take that long for the message to get to Jesus. And she was wondering why he didn't show up sooner. And so she says to Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And as they have that conversation about the resurrection and Jesus says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. It's as if Martha had forgotten that he is the one that is claiming to be the creator of all that he is the one to claim that he, is, that he has breathed life into creation and that he is the one that is simply going to call forth Lazarus out of this tomb. Mary thought his death was a step too far, that his, her brother's death was something that was too far, too big, too hard for, for Jesus to, to overcome. But Jesus says, no, 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 I am the resurrection. You see, in this moment, Jesus changes her perspective on the story. And he's going to change the perspective of Mary in just a moment. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you were looking frantically for something, looking frantically for your keys or your wallet or your phone, and you're trying so hard to find them, and you're trying so hard to find them, and you have someone saying, they're just trying to get your attention for a second, just trying to get your attention for a second. Mike, Mike, hey, Mike. I'm like, I can't look right now. I'm looking for my keys. I can't find my keys. And I hear this voice, Mike, Mike. And I'm looking, I'm trying to look in every place I can to find my keys. I'm checking under the couch. I'm checking in the couch cushions. Uh, 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 I'm, checking, I'm checking in the refrigerator and the freezer. I don't know why I always check there, but I do. And then I hear Mike, Mike, and it's Amy. And she's telling me she's literally holding my keys. See, there are moments when we get so lost in our perspective that we forget that there's someone calling us to a new perspective, a, a new look, a new way. In this moment... In those four days that Jesus waited before he came back to visit Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, there was a point behind it. 
You see, his delay did not equal his denial. He did not give them what they didn't want. He just made them wait a few moments for it. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. What resurrection is, is taking us from the old life and bringing new life. And I believe that we as people of faith in the middle of this crazy, crazy time are in the middle of this new resurrection time. Phyllis Tickle in her book, The Great Emergence, writes that every 500 years, the church has a major garage sale. It's usually because some major crisis is happening. And right now we're in the midst of a major crisis and I believe that we as people of faith get to get on board to that new great emergence, that resurrection that is happening in our world and in our lives. And so as we give this morning, I want us to give to that new thing that is taking place, the resurrection that is taking place in all of our lives, in our communities, and in our worlds. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the new life that has come. We thank you that through you, the resurrection and the life, we too can be the resurrection and the life. God, we pray that we as a church would live into the call of being the resurrection people. Called to be different and to live differently because we have known, have been known and deeply loved by you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. same God who never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will lift your name. Joy when my heart is heavy all my days. 
You see, what Jesus had done up until this point, people could say that he simply resuscitated people, that, he, that they weren't fully dead, they were just almost dead, like in The Princess Bride. No, this story, this story with Lazarus makes it so clear that he was dead, he was in the tomb. They even said before they bring him out, he says, you don't want to open up that tomb, Lord, he stinketh. Jesus, again, was approaching the impossible. And as they were waiting, something glorious was happening. A transformation was going on. Lazarus was going from just another healing to the impossible embodiment of the glorification of God. You see, when Jesus calls him forth, when Jesus brings him from the tomb, when Jesus breathes new life in him by simply saying, Lazarus, come out, no one can deny that that Jesus has power even over death. See, church, you and I need to remember that no one's waited longer than Lazarus, right? No one has had the biggest wait that, more than Lazarus. We don't know if he was in heaven. We don't know if he just closed his eyes. But I'm going to imagine just for a second that he had a four-day vacation in heaven and he got to see all the things that there were to see, that he got to experience all the things that there were to experience. And then someone tapped Lazarus on the shoulder and said, hey, you got to go back. Just for a little while, you got to go back. <laughs> He's like, I don't want to go back. It's too good. He said, no, you got to go back because it'll bring glory to God. You see, waiting for a divine purpose happens over and over again. God's delay is not God's denial. Let's take a look at sometimes where, where Scripture called the people of God to wait. Abraham, he waited till he was almost 100 years old for a son. Jacob waited for God to provide him a wife. Joseph waited for vindication and restoration of his family relationships. Mary, mother of Jesus, waited over 30 years for the prophecies to be fulfilled in her son that were given to her before he was even born. And now Mary, Martha, and Lazarus waited for the glory of God to be revealed in this moment. God's delay is not God's denial. Have you ever thought that maybe the moment that you're going through, that this, the, that this delay that you're currently stuck in, that God is using for his glory? Have you ever thought about that? That maybe your turmoil, <clears throat> that maybe your turmoil, that your struggle today, your worries today, the thing that you're waiting on today, God is going to use for his glory tomorrow. Have you ever thought that maybe that struggle, that 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 fight that you're in right now, that, that just on the other side of this fight, that God's glory is waiting, waiting for you for this moment where God's glory will be revealed in and through this, through this struggle. That maybe we have to wait these four days, these four long days, or maybe it's four long weeks, or four long months, or four long years, or 40 long years. God's delay is not God's denial because God's promises are going to hold true. And Jesus says that he is the resurrection and the life. It is in him. He is it. And you know, as I grow to trust Jesus more and more, and I find myself in struggles and worries just like you find yourself in struggles and worries, I can trust that in the midst of all of this, God is still at work, sometimes behind the scenes. God is still at work, even though it feels as if he, even though it feels as if he's been delayed, I know that he is not denying me or the world of his glory. That God is using even these moments right now, even, even the situation that the world is in right now for his glory. And as we wait, as we wait, as we wait, we know that he is not going to deny the world of his presence or his glory or his peace or his promise. So when what you want doesn't happen right away, and you find yourself in that place of waiting, when you find yourself in that place where you're still, where you find yourself in that place where you're, you're next, 
and next seems to be taking forever to get to where it's for you, I want you to be thinking about how God is going to use this moment, these times, this waiting period for his glory in your story. You see, when we start to reframe our lives and how God is going to use our story for his glory, our waiting for his glory, suddenly everything takes on new meaning, new significance. Every story in my life uh, begins to take on a brand new significance, especially the ones where I realized that I had to wait longer to see God's bigger plan at work. You all have seen that in your own lives, that sometimes it takes the long view before you recognize God's glory happening in your life. Jesus simply says this, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will live. God will often make us wait for a reason. And that reason is not a denial. It's just simply a delay. His glory is coming. Would you all pray with me as we recognize that God's delay is not God's denial? Father, we thank you on this day, on this day where we recognize uh, the, the, the independence of our nation, but we also recognize the amazing gift of the resurrection of a life after this life, of a life that is not constrained by death in any way, shape, or form, that the promise that you give lives on past today, past the grave, past our grave clothes, that with a simple word as you call us to come, we will come. Great God, give us the courage to trust in you more and more every day. Let us be people that are bold enough to reach, teach, and serve in your grace and truth and love and recognize that when we're called to wait, that your delay is not your denial. Amen and amen. When the early church gathered to do this, in remembrance of me as Christ asked us all to do. They brought what they had. They brought the juice they had in their house. They brought the bread they had in their home to celebrate this gift of love. Today we do the same thing. We bring what we have in our homes to celebrate Christ is alive in our lives and that his death and resurrection give us each new life. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And after supper, in the same manner, he took the cup and he blessed it and poured it out, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, which is sealed in my blood. All of you do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that as we celebrate this meal, we celebrate your life-giving love, which nourishes us and feeds us to do the work that you have called each and every one of us to do. May we be nourished this day to be your hands and feet in our world. In Christ's name we pray. The body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. For all of us. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. The Lord bless you. Make 
make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. 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 Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you. send you out with the hope and the promise of the good news on this Independence Day weekend. And so I send you with the love of God, with the power of the Holy Spirit, and the grace that comes from our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life. Amen and amen. May God be with you and bless you as you go. that you are here to worship with us today. And I'm always excited to be reminded of Christ's love for us. His love that was given to us. And because Christ's love was given to us, we get to show that love to other people. So let's do that today. Let's love with the great love that we've been loved. Have a great day.